The Azurians have never been particularly numerous people. Around 30,000 people is the largest number of them in their entire history. Living on rocky shores of the Gulf of Finland, Azurians were totally dependent on the sea. They also had to withstand their powerful neighbors. In 1240, the Azurian territory became part of the Novgorod state, and ever since then, the Azurians, together with the Russians, have been fighting for this territory. Furthermore, if someone invaded their land, and that land attracted many, the Finnish across the Gulf of Finland, the Estonians across the Narva River, everyone wanted this land. Then the Azurians were always ready to protect their land. They would pursue the invaders for months through the forests until everyone was killed. They posed a big threat to the Catholic Church at the time. Their medieval burials were indicative of the belligerent nature of the Azurian people. The few Azurians living in the village were very surprised to meet a young man who was fluent in their language and who generally displayed a sincere interest in them. There's nobody to talk to. I'm gradually forgetting the language. I don't have anyone to talk to in it. Good day. Well, hello, hello. How are you? We are well. How is your health? Well, so-so. My legs are troubling me, not too well, to be honest. The Azurians rarely allow a stranger into their homes, but it's a whole different story when a stranger speaks their own language. When it comes to Nikita, all the doors are open to him. There are a lot of interesting things to be seen in a traditional Azurian house. Look here. The grain was brought here by hand, and then it was spun this way. They'd spin it until the stones started making a different sound. Rye flour was used to make bread. Wheat flour was used for special occasions. There wasn't much wheat here. A visit like this provides Nikita with invaluable materials for his main work. A few years ago, he was invited to work in the Azurian Regional Museum in the Vistano village of the Soikano Peninsula. Since then, Nikita has conducted guided tours and there is a long waiting list due to his popularity. There were good and evil wizards who could cast a spell and spoil a wedding, and turn the newlyweds into wolves, for example, or into stones. The 17th century became a milestone in the history of the Azorian people. As a result of the Treaty of Stalbovo, signed in 1617, the Azorian land was given to the Swedes and remained a part of Sweden for almost a hundred years. The 17th century left an indelible imprint in the culture and memory, in the legends and the folklore of the Azurians. Their suffering was so very intense that it seems to have erased all their memories that belong to the ancient times. Successive wars, pestilence, plague, oppressive taxes, the forced imposition of the Lutheran faith, all of this led to the gradual decay of the Azurian land. The Azurians left their homes en masse, escaping to the Russian territories. In the 17th century, Ingria, that's how the Swedish called their land back then, lost over 20,000 people, which constituted over 70% of their population at the time, yet some remained. Sweden ruled over our land for a hundred years. There were a number of relief measures for the Lutherans. But that's common practice in some countries. Once an important superintendent, Hendrickson came to the Azurian church with the purpose of converting them to the Lutheran faith. An Azurian Kuzma spat into the missionary's face. What time, what time? At 12. Where? In Vistano, on the Soikana Peninsula. Ah, Vistano. In Vistano, Soikana. Vistano. All the local Azurians are looking forward to tomorrow's event. It's their annual celebration where not only their neighbors from all around gather, but also guests from abroad. Nikita has to put up the last posters and prepare for the event. 
He's a jack of all trades, and tomorrow the entire celebration will depend on him. His colleagues from St. Petersburg will also arrive tomorrow. Early the next morning, St. Petersburg, a rather flamboyant group of young people hits the road. A man happened to have a lot of misfortune in his life. A bad horse, a leaking boat, and an incapable wife who couldn't do anything around the house. Those strange, joyful people are volunteers at the center of indigenous people of the Leningrad region. These people of various occupations and ages study the Azorian language and culture under the vigilant guidance of the ethnographer and archaeologist Olga Konkova. A few years ago, they created a puppet theater named Kagrakaru, which means oatmeal bear in Azorian. It is the main attraction of the celebrations. Some royal dynasties know all about their ancestors dating back to the 12th century. For instance, they know their legends and traditions. And I think it's great to safeguard your culture, which belongs to every representative of the people. Like for example, all 15,000 songs sung by the Ijorians belong to me. It is very, very interesting. The Azurians have given the world a truly remarkable folklore, mainly in the form of songs. Many have heard the name of the famous Karelian Finnish epos Kalevala, but few people know that a good part of it was written in ancient Azurian runes. Over 145,000 Azurian songs were recorded in the 19th century. This is Yurchi, but he's not the only character. Well, in the Russian culture, it is Yegori. Now that it is summer, he doesn't need any warm clothes. He covered his head to protect it from the bright sunshine, put on a thick shirt to protect himself from the mosquitoes and gadflies so that he can calmly walk around the cows to collect and herd them back to their homes. The puppets are more than just vintage hand-stitched toys to the Azurians. Those puppets are their friends. They're magical guides into an Azurian-speaking world. She travels to different villages that were once the habitat of the Finno-Ugric people, and then she tells them all of our ancient legends. The 20th century was very tragic for the Azurians. The post-revolution times created more suffering for the Azurians than any other period in their centuries-old history. It all started great with a nationwide increase in the 1920s. In the beginning of the 1930s, the Azurians were given books, the freedom to practice their native language, Azorian village councils, and collective farms were created as well. And in 1937, everything ended in a harsh and unfair way. I think people still feel very emotional about those events. In the summer of 1937, all the Azurian schools were closed overnight. The teachers were arrested. The books that were in Azurian were burnt. Children were expelled from school for just speaking Azurian. And not only Azurians, but also their neighbors, the Votes, the Ingrians, the Karelians, and a large number of other small ethnic groups in Soviet Russia were victimized. And things only got worse. They also introduced a ban on fishing, and the Azurians are fishermen. They can't go without fishing. It was all official. The government started this. So for the people, that ban was catastrophic. 
Then the war started. The majority of Azurians did not have time to evacuate the land before the Germans arrived in the Sokino Peninsula. I've been through a lot. I was in a concentration camp, I was also a miner, and I was also in Finland. Wherever fate took me. The Germans rapidly moved northwest and besieged Leningrad, which is a well-known fact. The Azurians did not have an opportunity to get evacuated. Meanwhile, Finns, who fought on the side of the Nazis, needed free labor. The route to Finland for the Azurians went through the infamous Estonian concentration camp Kloga. Hard labor and years of war resulted in the exile of thousands of Azurians. The Germans didn't ask us. They'd come to your house by car? and they would tell you to get in. They didn't give us shoes. They burnt everything. Our village, our houses, we had nothing left to eat. I had to walk barefoot. That's why I can hardly walk now. I wore out everything within three months. My arms and my legs failed me because of the hard work. I was only 16 years old at the time. Nonetheless, the Azurians survived. Azurians are truly remarkable people. They are extremely proud. An Azurian will never change his mind. Judging by the roles played in the puppet theater, an Azurian is brief, especially with people who are close to him. But he tells his enemies exactly what he thinks of them in the finest detail before destroying them. The actors of the Oatmeal Bear appear in public in full national regalia, that is, dressed in national costumes. In a few minutes' time, the puppets will narrate a most remarkable story. It's better not to make the impatient spectators wait. Nikita is already on stage to open the festival. Like a golden field without limits, and the rustling of the trees reminiscent of the tides of the sea. The most sacred and dear to the heart is connected to you, dear Azorian land. The national Azorian costume is a different story. It's soaked in the entire ancient historical folklore and is filled with amulets and symbols. Traditionally, a man's costume had little embroidery, while a woman's outfit was lavishly decorated, with the predominant color being red, as the color red was considered to possess the strongest magical powers and to protect a woman from evil spirits. The charms are placed everywhere so that the woman is fully protected. Her head and ears are protected too, for example with pendants, so that the evil spirits cannot enter the ears. The charms at the back, they make a sound to frighten off the spirits. There are hidden charms in the front, on the apron. Everything would have gone well if it weren't for one thing. The Azurians didn't have light. They worked by candlelight and lived by touch. It was dark, gray, and boring. One day, a beautiful woman, the blacksmith's daughter, decided to go and look for the light for the people. She walked and arrived at a neighboring Finnish village where she saw that the people were happy because they had the sun and the moon. The Finnish people, being as stingy as they come, do not like to share, so instead of asking them, she used a sleeping potion and everyone fell asleep. The dogs stopped barking, the horses became silent, and the babies fell asleep. Then she quietly took the moon and the sun, placed them behind her back, and hurried back home. The Azurians were not allowed to go back home. In 1944, an offer was made for them to leave Finland and return to the USSR, and most of them accepted the offer. However, when they reached the border, they were instead taken to different remote areas where nobody was expecting them. Yes, we were seen as public enemies, and we were told that we had proved that we were guilty. Guilty of what? I asked them. What are we guilty of? You were in Finland. But we didn't go there voluntarily. We were taken there. It's a very sad story. It has affected not only my family, it's affected each and every Azurian family. 
all of us. You know for an Azorian, losing our homeland is like dying. But the history of the 20th century struggled to break the Azorians because they have a particularly strong and proud nature. When we went to pick berries in the forest with the elder Azorian women, they always started speaking their own language when they entered the forest. It made them look younger, when they joked and sang songs in Azorian. After the war, few people remembered about the Azorians. It wasn't customary to admit that you were different, and indeed, it was even dangerous. Azorians, who left to go to the cities for work, were rapidly assimilated. As per the census of 1970, just over 1,000 people were listed as Azorians. In 2010, 266. He told me, I heard there are Azurians in the Leningrad region. What are they, a kind of animal? That's it, that's that. What can we do? Life carries on. I did not imagine that a little spring would then turn into a river. Now that a keen interest in the Azorian language has arisen, both children and adults are learning it. And then everything started to change. First, volunteers appeared, including archaeologists, folklore collectors, teachers, students, old Azorian villagers and modern Azorians from cities. At times, my voice trembles. I feel like crying, but then I feel a relief. I pray that everything will be well at home, for the children to be healthy, for everything in general to be good, so that people live in peace and be kind to each other. Having survived persecution and much misfortune, the wise blacksmith's daughter managed to bring the sun and the moon to the Azorians. It's time to think of something that's more important. Of course, I dream of marrying an Azorian woman. I could then speak Azorian to her. And to our children, too. To preserve the language. Well, that's true. That's my dream. That's what I aspire to. She has a round face. That is the ideal for an Azorian beauty. She has to be rather round with narrow eyes so that a piece of straw doesn't enter her eyes and spoil them. Her legs must be stout and short so that she doesn't get tangled up in the hay. But this is the harsh reality. A thin Azorian woman is more like me. But when I get married, I'll be like her. The vibrant Azorian celebration has ended. It's time to go back home for the Omil Bear. The puppets seem to be murmuring in their suitcase, wondering where they will be going to next. Nikita is cleaning up, and when he's done, he'll continue his work together with the professor. This autumn, he and Olga Konkova are publishing a manual on the Azorian language. All people have their unique and at times harsh history. Who can say why the Azorians survived and what makes them so attached to their forest and this poor land? Why has the cold sea wind memorized their ancient ruins? Where does the wise blacksmith's daughter live? How does one make friends with forest spirits? There are many questions. Meanwhile, the Baltic Sea continues to roll. The forest rustles, the sun shines, and Pelgusi, the elder of the Azorian land, keeps gazing at the horizon. <laughs> Kahani, la pe, uh, kere, kahani.